Okay. Um, so uh, here I am with uh, Dermot Hudson of the KFA, and having recently changed my name, I am now uh, the Anglesist. So um, it's uh, lovely to greet all of you, and I think we will start off with some pre-prepared questions I have, and I will take some from the chat as it goes along. Um, so I've got a question, uh, Doctor. Uh, how did when and how did you become a leftist? Right. Well, um, that was right back in the seventies when uh, I was quite uh, young. I was about uh, thirteen or fourteen, and there were um, all kinds of things happening at the time. We had the Heath government, which at the time people thought was the first ever Tory government, uh, but of course that was before uh, Thatcher came. Uh, to power and uh, we we had the uh, miners strike uh, and many other important uh, class struggles and uh, I you know I had absolutely no idea about politics I uh, you know in fact when I was uh, about 12 I thought it was actually awful that the miners went on striking caused the power cut I thought that was that was terrible and I remember at, at uh, school two middle class brats uh, saying oh my daddy says everyone should be a capitalist not a socialist and I did not uh, know uh, what that actually meant uh, at all uh, and uh, uh, my mother sort of told me a few things about uh social justice i mean she she seemed to think uh that uh you know that um voting labor was was the answer and i i read uh very briefly a, a labor party leaflet where it talked about redistributing wealth and i thought that was uh a good idea uh in the meantime uh you know i found out about uh the Soviet Union about the socialist countries, uh, you know, in a bit of a strange way at first, I actually read a, a kid's sci-fi novel uh, where a Soviet uh, cosmonaut and an American astronaut go on uh, a joint mission together. And, uh, you know, the, the American came over as very undisciplined and individualistic and, uh, you know, the impression i got uh, from the book was that the soviet union was a very disciplined society and uh i also read a book that my mother had by an american sociologist about the uh soviet union called russians as people uh and uh was quite impressed by soviet society and i came across as very moral very disciplined and uh, also one one day my mother had gone on a trip to london and bought back a copy of the soviet weekly uh which was a publication uh uh published by the soviet embassy in london and you know i was quite impressed reading about the achievements uh, and uh housing in the soviet union so you know I, I became uh, a leftist and then turned uh, gradually towards uh, communism. Uh, brilliant. That actually answered my first two questions because the second one was how did you learn about communism? Uh, so, um, but how did you learn about Juche specifically? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, again a bit of a long, long story. Uh, uh, as I say, you know, I've managed to answer two questions in one. Uh, you know, after I be, uh, became interested in communism, I uh, joined the Young Communist League, uh, the youth wing of the old CPGB. Uh, when I was 14, uh, I had to look for the address in a Kelly's directory. Uh, and, uh, you know, it took some time to get signed up for it. I mean, been undiplomatic here i think a big problem with a lot of british left and communist organizations is incompetence you know 
it often uh, you hear this uh, from a lot of people you know they, they've been waiting ages to join etc etc but anyway um on to the dprk and duce uh, I was in the CBGB, uh, initially supported the party program, the British Road to Socialism and all the rest of it. I became uh, disillusioned quite quickly. It struck me that the party was reformist. Uh, mm. It was capitulationist. Uh, you know, it was collaborating with capitalism. So uh, like some people, I, uh, you know, I turned... Uh, towards the Soviet Union as a source of inspiration. And, of course, we had people in the CPGB who uh, believed that the, somehow the Soviet Union could solve the problems of the British Party. Uh, you know, I don't know how, by what which mechanism they thought that was possible. Uh, but um, when I looked at the Soviet Union, I... Also became very uneasy about that. Uh, you know, this was a few years before Perestroika. And, uh, you know, it struck me that the Soviet Union was not that much better than the the uh, uh, CBGB in Britain. Uh, you know, it was collaborating with imperialism. It allowed Pepsi-Cola to set up a plant in the Soviet Union, it was, you know, it was doing deals with um, US imperialism, you know, detente, uh, salt, peaceful coexistence, this sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, I became quite uh, disillusioned. And uh, uh, at the same time, I didn't want to abandon the idea, the ideal of socialism and communism. Uh, so I looked elsewhere for inspiration. Uh, I was a bit interested in Cuba, in Vietnam. Uh, yes, Albania appealed to me a bit, but they came across as a bit, uh, a bit uh, ultra left. You know, I know you've got a question on that, so I won't <laughs> go into Albania now. And. Uh, you know, I was quite curious about this Far Eastern socialist country, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, uh, I read uh, an essay by Bruce Cummings uh, in a, a free volume uh, work called Marxist Regimes, a World Survey. Uh, I was fairly impressed uh, with the DPRK couldn't really find, didn't really, you know, I uh, don't think Cummings' essay, well, it was just an essay in a book, uh, really got really too deep into the subject matter. So I said to myself, I'm going to find out more about this uh, North Korea, about this Democratic People's Republic of Korea. I tried asking some old party members in my branch, and I got... Um, in my CPGB branch, I got a very rusty answer. You know, I was told, oh, them, they're funny, just like the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that's how, uh, you know, the C uh, a lot of the CPGB saw the DPRK. And, uh, and I think, unfortunately, on the British left, you've still got echoes of that mentality. You know, it's quite deeply embedded. Uh, so, you know, I was able to actually see a DPRK pictorial magazine in a library in London. And, uh, you know, my curiosity was still growing. There was uh, some press articles about the DPRK. One, you know, might sound surprising, one by an Australian journalist called Murray Sale in the Observer Colour Supplement was almost favourable towards the DPRK. And there was a more hostile article by Peter McGill the following year in the the, uh, the Observer. So my curiosity was uh, growing. Uh, I asked uh, at my local Morningstar readers and supporters group where I could uh, get books about the DPRK where I could find the uh, works of uh, Kim Il-sung. And uh, 
I got a grumpy answer. You know, someone said, ooh, there's a load of them in a second-hand bookshop in Southampton. But I was told, oh, you don't want to read them. You want to read Novosti books. Novosti being the press agency of the, the former USSR. So when on my next visit to Southampton, I was able to buy a volume five of Kim Il-sung's selected works, which I still got today. Uh, a little book called Korean Review, all about the DPRK. And I think one of two other books from the DPRK. I read Kim Il-sung's uh, selected works. Very impressed. There was uh, his speech uh, to, uh, you know, to the Korean People's Army on the occasion of its 20th anniversary, where he refers to the Pueblo uh, crisis and uh, a speech about the 20th anniversary, the foundation of the DPRK, as well as a work uh, dedicated to the memory of Major Ernesto Che Guevara. Uh, so reading these, uh, the DPRK came across as the most revolutionary, the most principled socialist country that didn't want to compromise with imperialism. And in my head, I said, yes. Uh, and uh, I started to study the Duce idea, which was very unfamiliar to me, never heard of before. Uh, you know, the CPGB, which had fraternal relations uh, with the <clears throat> Workers' Party career, never uh, mentioned uh, the Duce idea. Uh, so at first I was perhaps a little bit mystified, uh, but gradually I studied the Duce idea and realised it, you know, is the uh, correct idea for socialist construction by stressing independence, by stressing that the popular masses are the masters of the revolution and that they are responsible for it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you see after this, um, I mean, I'm going to just compare to one thing because it's the only, I consider the only other existing socialist country, Cuba. Why were you uh, more compelled towards Duke shaving, let's say, uh, ideas of Cuban socialism? for example right uh well uh you know in, in uh no way do i disparage uh uh cuban socialism and in fact you know uh i regard uh fidel as a great revolutionary uh and uh you know at the time uh you know when these ideas were forming you know i considered uh cuba to be a revolutionary socialist country like the DPRK, different uh, from uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, however, the difference is that uh, the DPRK was able to maintain independence. In the 1960s, a number of uh, countries, uh, socialist countries, uh, held similar positions, that is the DPRK, Cuba, and Vietnam. Uh, but, uh, you know, gradually uh, Cuba became uh, close to the USSR uh, and was regarded as the, uh, an ally of the USSR, whereas the DPRK was independent, independent from the USSR. Uh, so that was the reason uh, I preferred the uh, DPRK. Mm. Ah, fair enough. Uh, by the way, just to the chat, you can like put questions and see if I find something interesting or if Hudson finds something interesting, I'll highlight the question. Um, but, I mean, actually, with the... Uh, I, sorry, I was confused because I thought... It, because the way I asked the question was different towards uh, to how it's written down, so I almost confused it. So the big question that is like on the left. Of the um, do you consider China to be socialist? Why or why not? 
Right. Uh, well, uh, that's uh, a very complicated question. Uh, let me uh, sort of say first that I'm, I'm going to just give my own individual personal view uh, of China. And uh, what I say uh, does not necessarily uh, is not necessarily the view of the Korean French Association or the British Group for the Study of the Duce idea. Yeah, um, you know, it's stressed that there's a close relationship between China and the DPRK. Uh, you know, they fought together. Uh, the Korean and Chinese communists fought together against. Uh, the Japanese in the 1930s, uh, after liberation in 1945, uh, the DPRK assisted the People's Liberation Army of China in its struggle against the uh, KMT reactionaries. And then, of course, as we all know, uh, China sent uh, volunteers to the Korean uh, War. So, you know, it's a close relationship between uh the two countries, you know, I would stress that. However, uh, uh, you know, the DPRK is no one's puppet. It's its own master and it's, uh, you know, developed its own form of socialism. Uh, China, yeah. Um, when I've been through uh, China, I've not been terribly impressed uh, by it. Um, yeah, you know, when I was there in 2019, I was uh, uh, disappointed, uh, though it wasn't unexpected to notice that you uh, had a McDonald's, a KFC and a Starbucks uh, near to Tiananmen Square, you know, near to the revolutionary monuments of the Chinese people. And of course, um, for you know, people who have been to China will know that as soon as you uh, come out of um, the plane at Beijing Airport and you go through customs, etc., uh, one of the first things you will see is a KFC or a McDonald's. Uh, so, you know, in my opinion, uh, reform and opening up uh, went uh, too far, uh, basically. You say stress, that's a personal opinion. Uh, I think China has some socialist features. I would say uh, it is residually socialist. Uh, but, you know, uh, we mustn't uh, close our eyes to the fact that capitalism has made deep inroads in, into uh, China. I mean, I think the... Um, one of the few positive uh, features I noticed about China when I passed through it is the, uh, uh, you know, Chinese metro, you know, Chinese underground is still fa fairly cheap. It's about 30 or 40 pence. I mean, you know, dirt cheap uh, compared to uh, London uh, and other British cities, uh, but actually more expensive than uh, Pyongyang. Uh, and I think that uh, I think that's a good uh, way of uh, sort of uh, uh, you know describing uh, China. You know, it, it's uh, better than uh, the capitalist countries, but uh, not not as good as the uh, DPRK. I don't know if that actually answers your question. I mean, you kind of did, but it's like whether you consider it to be degenerating back to capitalism or to have already degenerated back to capitalism. I've, you know, when I've be, been in China, you, yeah, I mean, you don't see too much socialism there. And, uh, you know, uh, like you say, I think um, capitalism and imperialism have made very deep inroads. Uh into uh, China, and it will be difficult to reverse it, but of course, never impossible. Uh, it's my personal hope that uh, one day uh, the the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party will wake up and uh, see what's going on and uh, end reform and opening up and start reversing it. 
uh, and indeed, um, you know, uh, imperialism has its sights on China. Uh, you know, they uh, support anti-China movements in Hong Kong uh, in, and amongst the Chinese Muslims. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, uh, this is very dangerous for China. And, you know, they need, um, they need to uh, recognise uh, this danger. Now, whether they will is, is, another, uh, is another question. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there is uh, a very strong danger of complete capitalist restoration in China. I, my stance personally is that it is a progressive but non-social nation. Uh, that's just uh, that's usually what I say. At least I'd like to, it, with topics like those, you can talk about them for like literally forever. But I'm going to take a question from the chat. So I'll display that. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I've just read the question. Well, uh, there's several ways. Uh, I'm going to uh, start by saying well, the, the first way is to join the KFA and become active in the uh, KFA. Uh, you know, follow our websites, our Facebook pages and our Twitter. Uh, you'll find a lot of information about the DPRK that shows the reality of uh, the uh, DPRK. Uh, and also, uh, there's now a very good DPRK website, DPRK Today, uh, which is so you've, you've got a face um, a Facebook page for DPRK Today as well. Uh, that's that's one way. I would always say, you know, uh, try to visit the DPRK yourself and see it. But of course. Um, in the United States, you are banned by the government from travelling to the DPRK, and it's also, uh, you know, realistically, it's quite expensive uh, for a lot of people. Uh, so I would say, you know, look at different DPRK websites, uh, KFA websites, uh, get involved uh, with with uh, K, uh, KFA, and that's uh, that's a way of. Uh, uh, countering uh, anti-DPRK propaganda. I'd also mention, you know, I'm being biased here, and as I don't like to uh, indulge in self-promotion, I've read and um, written a number of uh, books, uh, such as In Defence of Juche Korea, and a number of uh, other books uh, where I defend the DPRK. And also... Um, if you go to the Nainara website, uh, there are many uh, free downloadable books uh, published in the DPRK in the English language uh, that you can read. And also um, periodical uh, as well. Right. The Falcon General. Mr. Hudson, do you have any books you can recommend? Uh, well, uh, you mean other than my own, uh, right? I would recommend uh, people uh, read it, it's free of charge, it's in on the internet. Uh, uh, Duke's idea, um, answers to a hundred questions. Uh, read the book on the uh, Duke's idea by uh, comrade Kim Jong il. That's a very good uh, uh introduction to the subject uh you know um for general reference uh i would uh recommend uh, you know again the these are downloadable on the internet free of charge um uh the uh, little booklets uh korea in the 21st century dprk seven uh decades of uh, change uh, you know, those, you know, should be able to find those uh, uh, free of charge. <clears throat> In fact, I've got them on my uh, Google Drive. And uh, 
one book which I think is quite good, though it's it's very dated now, uh, is the uh, book called Modern Korea by Kim Pyong Sik, uh, who later became a DPRK vice president. And the book uh, was actually published by International Publishers of New York. And uh, you can find this on the internet essay. It is free to download, but it is a fairly old uh, book. And as I say, uh, you know, there are also uh, several of uh, my books. In fact, uh, one of those is actually on the website of the Korean Association of Social Scientists, uh, and you can read it free there and other DPRK uh, books. Maybe I could put, uh, when I, we, we finish, I can put some links up to DPRK websites in the comments on the video. Hello. Um, this might function better. There we go. Yeah, uh, I can see you now, loud and clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. Um, so, seeing as you are old enough uh, to. Remember the uh, uh, you were old enough to remember when uh, the Soviet Union was still around, when um, uh, the uh, when uh, China was uh, didn't do the Deng reforms. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Sino-Soviet splits? Right, uh, a sort of complex again, bit of complex subject, uh, very interesting one. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, uh, the development of modern revisionism in the Soviet Union uh, caused the uh, split along with uh, a big power chauvinist attitude of the CPSU to try and impose its uh, line on uh, other parties. You know, it was trying to uh, assert that its particular policies constituted uh the general line for the world communist movement. Uh, however, uh, you know, though the initial criticisms made by the Chinese party in the early 60s were valid and justified, uh, China seemed to fall down, uh, you know, into the rabbit hole of uh, ultra leftism and uh, uh, sectarianism. Uh, you, you know, they they encourage breakaway parties in some countries. Uh, 
President Kim Il-sung himself in 1966, he made a speech to a specially convened conference of the Workers' Party Korea in which he criticised both modern revisionism and what he called left uh, opportunism. Uh, at the same time, he argued uh, for the unity of the socialist camp and the international communist movement. And the Workers' Party of Korea was one of the few uh, parties that uh, was able to maintain relations with both China and the Soviet Union and uh, President Kim Il-sung uh, was probably uh, I think the only uh, leader amongst the socialist countries who actually met both Mao and Brezhnev obviously at different times uh, so I mean with the uh, with Chi uh, with the Chinese party uh, like I said I think initially that you know they, their analysis was a good one but uh they uh believed that uh, capitalism had been restored in the soviet union by about 1964 and uh, th they then went on to say that not only was the soviet union capitalist but it was imperialist it was social imperialist according to them uh and even social fascist and as a result, uh, uh, there was some, you know, real uh, massive uh, foreign policy blunders committed by China because they uh, believed in trying to unite with anyone who was uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, so for that reason, uh, when you had the Pinochet uh, coup uh, in Chile in 1973, uh, they didn't break uh, relations with uh, Chile and uh, you know they ended up uh, you know backing uh, counter-revolutionary uh, movements in, in one or two countries simply because they were anti-Soviet because they genuinely believed that the Soviet Union was imperialist that it was expansionist that it was even fascist uh, so they thought they thought they you know were building a united front against Soviet social imperialism, but of course uh, they you know they 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 were not, and I think you know a lot of this sprung uh, from the error of believing that capitalism had been completely restored in uh, the Soviet Union. At the same time, of course, the Soviet Union uh, was revisionist. Uh, Basically, um, what Khrushchev had done in 1956 was put the Soviet Union on a long and slow road to self-destruction in 1991. Mm. Um, so somebody, I'm just going to preface that my camera quality has uh, gone down because I'm using the native camera of the laptop because of my actual uh, camera that I use crapped out. But this is a common, uh, common uh, slight against Duke Chase, so I feel you addressing it would be good now. Right, you mean the, the question here? From yes. Haran B's son, could you ask? Right, well, no, uh, no uh, Duke Chase doesn't uh, reject uh, dialectical materialism uh, because... Uh, uh, Juche is uh, based on materialism. Uh, you know, it's not idealist because, uh, you know, the idea of um, uh, idealists is that, you know, man's destiny is uh, controlled by, uh, by God or by some sort of uh, force that exists outside of uh, uh, nature, whereas Juche asserts that uh, man as the highest developed form of matter is the master. And that is a materialist approach. And uh, Comrade Kim uh, Jong-il uh, stressed, uh, may, you know, that Juche uh, uh, doesn't reject dialectical materialism, uh, but actually takes dialectical materialism as its premise uh, because... Um, uh, you know, 
dialectical materialism is very simply explained uh, by, you know, that the world is made of matter, uh, which is changing all the time. You know, basically that is that is how the world is. Uh, but um, where sort of a, a, a Duce uh, sort of uh, was was different uh, was it, it stressed that you know uh, the you know laws of nature uh, you know do not extend in into society uh, or at least uh, you know if when they do it's in in a different way you know it, they uh Duce stressed the role of man uh in society the role of humans in a changing uh society and you know it stressed the uh you know the subjective factor mm. I don't you know, I, I kind of said that, like, and the, this is wrong, but for j jokes, I occasionally say that, like, Juche is kind of like Marxist humanism if Marxist humanists weren't armchairists. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a fair way, way of uh, uh, pu putting it. I mean, Juche is, is uh, very humanist in its, uh, in its outlook. Hmm. So um, here you go. I've ba it's basically just questions on figures at this point. But um, so I I've heard of your views on Castro before, and I people could probably like uh, you know figure it out based on the, your support of Korea, but you'd also support Cuba. But what do you think of as a Cub Castro as a revolutionary um, and as a leader of a country? I I think he was uh, a a great uh, great leader, a great revolutionary. Uh, you know, uh, second uh, basic, basically to the great Korean uh, revolutionary uh, leaders, uh, and uh, in many ways uh, quite um, you know there's uh, similarities uh, because both President Kim Il Sung and uh, Fidel, uh, you know came to power through uh, guerrilla struggles uh you know and the story of the cuban revolutionaries of uh, fidel and jay is a, a very heroic story you know of how they started the revolution with just uh, seven rifles uh and uh, you know fought you know fought out the revolution by by themselves and it's also significant um that uh Fidel had to fight against dogmatists in the the so-called Cuban Communist Party that existed at the time. Uh, you know, there was dogmatists in the uh, Cuban Party that tried to block uh, the revolution. Uh, initially, uh, they didn't support the revolutionary struggle in Cuba, and I think only uh, joined in when it, uh, it looked like uh, it was becoming uh, successful. Um, you know, I stress I'm not an expert on Cuban history, but that's my understanding, which, you know, I'm prepared to uh, stand corrected on. Uh, so, you know, there's some uh, similarities to the uh, DPRK, uh, where uh, President Kim Il-sung had to fight against dogmatists and factionalists in, in the Korean uh, party who wanted to copy uh, foreign uh, uh, models. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know the Cuban Revolution was was absolutely wonderful. And say, so, like like the DPRK, it's a small country fighting on its own, uh, you know, against overwhelming odds. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm quite uh, you know, I uh, I highly respect uh, the the memory of uh, Comrade uh, Fidel. Mm. Um, fair enough. I was just curious if there's anything particular from Fidel that uh, you have taken from, or you have like uh, you, you have given great thought about anything uh, particular about uh, the Cuban Revolution or, or just Castro's writings. If you've, uh, I assume you've read them at this point. 
I've, I've read uh, some of them. Uh, you know, I've read the Havana Declaration. Uh, read, uh, I have to admit, some time ago, Man and Socialism uh, by uh, uh, Che Guevara. And I also remember um, in the 1980s being in Revisionist Hungary, uh, which was about one of the, you know, the most revisionist of all these European socialist countries. And I was able to pick up a copy of Grandma, the Cuban newspaper, at a newsstand, uh, you know, it was an English language, and I read uh, Fidel's speech attacking Perestroika. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I'm very, uh, uh, you know, very, very impressed uh, with that. And, it, of course, you know, everyone knows about the uh, achievements made by the Cuban people in healthcare, uh, despite the intense blockade by the Yankees. Uh, I was. I'm pretty much gonna skip the views on Kim Il Sung because, like, um, you've talked about him frequently throughout this on even on other topics. So I feel like that it's just gradually uh, will come up in the conversation. Right. Yeah. Uh, so views on Hozier, which I felt was kind of important because I have brought this question up to you before. But there is a uh, there is similarity between uh, uh, what Hoja tried to do and what Korea has uh, done. Yeah, I think it's a very superficial uh, similarity because I mean, this year I did actually uh, take time out to read one of uh, uh, the history of the Party of Labour of Albania. Uh, yeah, I mean these some big similarities. I mean, both countries uh, stressed uh, self-reliance. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, Hodger was, uh, you know, ultra-leftist or leftist. And uh, he, uh, you know, uh, carried his sectarianism into foreign policy. Uh, and you know, attacked just about every other socialist country, you know, quite publicly, which the DPRK has not done. Uh, you, you know, if according to Hodger, just about everyone uh, was else was revisionist. In fact, uh, he even uh, came out with extreme statements like, you know, that some of the socialist countries had never even been uh, socialist. I mean, I, I just, was, oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm someone who didn't like reform and opening up in China. Uh, but sort of Hodger was, uh, ended up saying that China had never been a socialist country in the first place. You know, that, that Mao was some sort of bourgeois nationalist or national revolutionary. My favourite uh, quote from Ho one of my uh, favourite bad quotes from Hozier. He does have some very good quotes, but my favourite bad quote from Hozier is that the great proletarian cultural revolution was neither great nor proletarian nor cultural nor a revolution. Yeah, I think he's taking that. Um, that's paraphrasing what I think an American uh, once wrote about about something. Uh, I mean, yeah, on that, uh, yeah, I mean, the Cultural Revolution was an ultra-left uh, mistake by the Chinese party, and you know, the PLA uh, ended up having to restore order in China. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, Hodger was writing that with hindsight, because at, at the time... Uh, they supported China 100%, un unlike the DPRK, which did make some criticisms publicly. Mm. Whereas, um, you know, for a long time, uh, Hodger uh, supported uh, China. Uh, there was, uh, I think, several things uh, in Albania, like a steelworks got named after Chairman Mao. Uh, you know, Hodger only uh, started saying these things after about 1977 or 1978. And um, 
I think, as I've said before, when I've written, I think, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I judge Hodger by the facts uh, that uh, today the DPRK is a socialist country, but where is socialist Albania? Um, they collapsed along with the, the rest. Uh, okay, they managed to hold out uh, a bit longer, but, you know, the person, Hodger, had, uh, you know, Hodger's successor, Ramizalia, was the Albanian Gorbachev, who uh, sort of un undid all the achievements of uh, socialist Albania. Mm. Uh, so since you've touched on uh, Mao, what are your views on Mao, his writings and uh, his impact on China? Well, um, on the positive side, I think, um, uh, you know, he was a great revolutionary leader who uh, led the uh, revolution in China, who was able to unite China because historically uh, China has been a country of sort of uh, different uh, warring factions or, you know, in ancient history, warring kingdoms. And he was able to uh, unite the Chinese people to carry out the uh, uh, Chinese revolution and overthrow uh, feudalism and imperialism, start uh, building uh, a new, uh, you know, socialist country in China. Uh, however, in my my opinion, uh, you know, he he deviated to the uh, to the left uh, later. You know, became uh, quite ultra leftist. Um, uh, you know. Uh, haven't actually read many of his works and in fact i don't i don't think there are that many works actually produced by uh by mao you know compared to the the korean uh leaders however you know i would not uh slight uh mao you know uh you know the chinese uh people's revolution in china was a great achievement Oh, here's a question that was a while ago, but I think it's a, a good one. Right. What they can learn uh, from uh, Duke Chen. Well, I think the main thing uh, is independence, that every country uh, and every people have got to be independent. Uh, you know, they've got to uh, learn the idea of carrying out the revolution in your own country uh, independently, not copying uh, foreign models, uh, you know, and that of course means that uh, Duce will need to be uh, creatively uh, applied in different countries. You, uh, you know, you can't um, simply copy uh, the uh, DPRK. Uh, you need to apply Duce creatively, and uh, you know, I think um, particularly the countries of the third world, uh, they can learn from the uh, DPRK's example of an independent national economy. Uh, you know, they can build uh, in economies that are independent from subordination and domination and stand on their own two feet. So I think um, in uh, that respect, I think many countries uh, can uh, learn fr uh, from it uh, and indeed uh, even uh, in Britain you know we got this post brexit debate and all all this stuff about getting uh, getting the best deal or, or you know fears of no deal and I thought well you know if we this country was self-sufficient you know we wouldn't have these uh, problems you know they're talking about you know possibility of food shortages in this country but you know uh you know if um the if britain leaves the eu without a deal uh so i think uh Duce is relevant to every country in the world because you know every country wants to be independent mm. yeah if we actually had uh, the same industry even that we did in the 19 the mid 1970s Brexit probably wouldn't be the same, uh, the same yeah. uh, task that it would be now. 
I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, personally, I do think that uh, uh, leaving the EU, I mean, it's it's my personal preference, but only uh, really comes about in the specific case of like when we would have to, which would be in a country that has massively took worker power, where we couldn't allow ourselves to be a part of EU imperialism. However, yeah. we've however we've left in the pursuit of our own regaining of that status that we used to have I yeah like. which uh, i think is quite uh quite illusory uh you know and I, I think the way brexit is being handled is, is very bad and it, it is at, at the cost of the uh the people mm. um why do you think Cuba is less vilified than the DPRK in media, in liberal circles, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Well, I think I think there's all uh, sorts of uh, reasons for that. Um, I would say because the DPRK is a uh, nuclear armed power, it is seen as more of a serious threat to U.S. imperialism and world imperialism. Uh, you know, whereas Cuba doesn't have uh, nuclear uh, weapons, it doesn't have a nuclear deterrent. Uh, you know, I think the DPRK is hated by the imperialists because it's built up this uh, powerful self-defence uh, capability. Uh, you know, the DPRK is seen as a hardline, unreformed uh, socialist country, whereas I think, uh, you know, dare I say, you know, it's a, a thorny subject. You know, I've heard different opinions on, you know, Cuba has uh, apparently initiated some uh, reforms. I remember still... the Raul reforms would probably be the biggest ones, which yeah, yeah, did allow for some foreign investment and some uh, small businesses. Yeah. However, well, it's not like China or anything like that. That's it. true. I, I was going to say, you know, but that Cubans stress their socialist orientation uh but that's uh part of the uh reason uh, i think part of uh, you know one of the you know the reasons uh why uh cuba tends to be less uh vilified i mean it still does get vilified by um mad cuban gasanos in uh, miami and uh, even liberal pundits you know oh, oh yes yeah, some some liberals like owen jones uh, but I do do accept your basic point. It, it, it doesn't uh, suffer from the sort of industrial scale demonization that DPRK does. Uh, and, you know, there's several other reasons. Uh, you know, uh, the DPRK actually fought uh, US imperialism and British imperialism in the 1950s uh, and various um, satellite states of imperialism gave them a bloody nose uh you know i don't i don't think the dprk has ever been uh, f been forgiven by uh, the ruling class in the imperialist countries for that uh i think the british ruling class is particularly uh, vindictive and has a long memory uh you know th this is one i think factor why this you know this kind of hostility to the dprk and uh, dare I say, um, I suspect there's racial elements to it, you know, hostility towards East Asian people. Uh, Cuba is a Spanish-speaking uh, 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 country. Uh, people see it as part of European culture. Well, you know, pe Cuban pe a lot of Cuban people are obviously of European descent, so, you know, they... They're perceived as being part of Europe, you know, whether that is true or not, uh, you know, is another question. So that's a reason for it. Uh, I think some uh, people on the left um, don't fully un understand the Cuban socialism uh, and basic, you know, basically see it as a, a liberal socialism, whereas DPRK is, you know, seen as, you know, the real hardliners, the ultra-Stalinists, goodness knows what. 
are uh, you know so, so you know i think there are some people who who have been falsely idolizing uh cuba and and venezuela you know and don't don't really understand the uh situa uh you know situations in in those countries yeah i don't know if that answers your question no that answered my question pretty well um here we go Um, oh, the answer um, is yes, uh, DPRK is uh, building uh, nuclear power stations on a modest scale, not on a massive scale, but yes, yeah, so DPRK uh, is using nuclear energy for power generation. At the same time, it uses all sorts of alternative and renewable energy sources uh, like tidal power, wind power solar power very extensively and um something i don't fully understand geothermal power you know which you know comes from the center of uh the earth uh uh you know the other part of the question bit a uh, bit reserved about this here you know and the stress you know um uh it's just a personal view of uh mine uh, again, you know, it's not a view of KFA. I mean, KFA doesn't take any uh, position on the uh, use of, uh, you know, for or against the use of nuclear power. Uh, you know, I would say under the right conditions uh, and in a socialist society uh, where production is planned and production is for need, uh, you know, nuclear power can be uh, utilised. You know, but of course, only when uh, safety concerns are uh, addressed. Uh, however, in capitalist society, you know, just like with any uh, technology, you know, there there are dangers of having nuclear power uh, in uh, in a capitalist society. You know, capitalists, you know, uh, may try to cut costs by skimping on. Uh, safety and you know with uh, nuclear power that, that could be quite quite disastrous you know uh you know the force of a nuclear power station ex exploding is um is an, a, a truly horrendous fault uh mm. so you know that's that's my views on nuclear power okay so um what is your uh, definition of socialism like uh Right. Well, my uh, definition um, uh, would put it in two parts. Uh, the old fashioned part, um, which is still valid today, uh, the uh, social collective ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Uh, and the Duce uh, definition, um, you know, basically when uh, exploitation and oppression by uh, exploitative uh, ruling classes are ended and uh and you know people uh, become uh the masters of everything with everything uh serving them and you know all the resources being used for the people's ben benefit and the you know independence of the masses uh being realized in that society hmm. um so where do you think a career is in world politics in the 21st century? And where, what do you think, uh, if you can speculate, um, what do you think uh, will happen in the next five years? Well, um, you know, I think um, it is a fact, you know, whether people like it or not. Uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula is uh, an area of great uh, geopolitical significance. Uh, because uh, Korea is like the gateway to Northeast Asia, indeed the whole of uh, Asia. Uh, and in fact, um, that was one of the reasons why the US imperialists started the uh, Korean War, because they saw the Korean Peninsula as the bridgehead uh, into the Asian continent. And uh, I think that's true today. Uh, uh, you know, the, the US 
would like to have troops on the borders of the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation. And the uh, uh, DPRK in today's world is adhering to socialist principles, to revolutionary class principles. It's maintaining independence. Uh, it's still uh, really with uh, um, in confrontation with imperialism, even though uh, you know, in the last two years, a lot of the tensions got relaxed. But, you know, the fact is that confrontation is still there behind the scenes. It's going on behind the scenes. You know, in the last few weeks, uh, the US has twice imposed sets of sanctions on different companies, allegedly, because they traded with the DPRK. So that would give you some idea of... Um, uh, you know, what's going on. As to the future, it's difficult to speculate. Um, you know, Trump, uh, who sort of, uh, who on the one hand was an awful uh, racist and all the rest of it and an extreme reactionary, um, but on the other hand had pursued uh, a form of engagement with the DPRK. In fact, went out on a limb compared to previous US regimes because he actually met the uh, uh, Marshal Kim Jong-un, the DPRK Supreme Leader. You know, Trump's gone. Uh, and, you know, he got a new character in charge in the US, uh, Biden. And uh, no one knows what uh, really sort of policy he's going to uh, sort of pursue towards the DPRK. Some indicators suggest that it will actually be very hostile. Uh, during the US election, he gratuitously dragged uh, the DPRK into the election debate, slandered the supreme leadership and the socialist system. <coughs> Excuse me. So that doesn't uh, bide very well uh, for the future. Hmm. Uh, so, you know... <clears throat> Possibly the confrontation will become quite intense as before. Uh, I'm not too sure whether the US really would like to see a sort of uh, uh, military confrontation or whether they'd like to sort of stir up military uh, tension like they did in 2016, 2017, 2013, I think. You know, they are actually very frightened of fighting an actual physical war with the DPRK. Because uh, even a, a very limited DPRK nuclear strike on a US city uh, would kill, you know, about 10 or 20 times the amount of people who died in 9 11. So, you know, I think the, deep, um, the US. Uh, would actually shy away from, her, that, you know, anything approaching a direct military confrontation. However, they will find other means, and I think there will be increased anti-DPRK propaganda using the human rights issue, um, probably be more sanctions, uh, you know, probably given a sort of negative perspective on... Uh, US DPRK relations. Uh, they say it's hard to predict. You know, some people are, <clears throat> are muttering, but I've seen nothing concrete that um, the uh, US will, in the end, accept the DPRK's nuclear deterrent. You know, they switch to a policy like they had with the Soviet Union of um, trying to limit the DPRK's weaponry. Uh, but so I've never seen nothing concrete, but, you know, that could happen, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Workers' Party of Korea is holding its 8th Congress in January, uh, which is going to be upon us very soon, uh, January 2021, <coughs> at which they will uh, map out a strategy for the uh, next five years. 
Mm. Uh, what I've seen so far with um, the uh, uh, last two political bureau meetings of the Workers' Party of Korea, um, uh, the DPRK is stepping up the struggle against anti-socialist and non-socialist acts. Uh, and indeed, a uh, uh, law on rejecting reactionary ideology and culture has just been passed in the DPRK. Uh, so that may, I'd stress may, be uh, indicative of um, the road the uh, DPRK is going to follow over the next few years. You know, I would actually like to talk about how... Um... You informed me of this, that the uh, UN Council of Human Rights on the DPRK has never gone to or consulted uh, the Korean government and has only gone off to effect a testimony, which I was shocked by. <laughs> that yeah. You're that blatant. It is, uh, it is very shocking. It's, uh, you know, it's blatant bias. And the, you know, I've read parts of um, the so-called UN uh, commission of inquiry reports on the dprk and uh <clears throat> what they show what they betray uh is an actual hostility to uh the uh dprk is a socialist state you know the dprk uh is uh, condemned for carrying out ideological uh education you know i believe they you know based the report on the idea of the uh, right of private property uh for example but you know is a fact they never visited the uh dprk and it is based on the testimony of i think about 200 uh, defectors you know and of course it's going to be a very biased and subjective uh, document uh dprk in the past has let in uh amnesty international who were able to meet with judges in the DPRK and see a uh, re-educational facility in, in, in the DPRK. But the UN Commission of Inquiry uh, didn't set foot in the uh, uh, DPRK, uh, but, you know, uh, they instead visited South Korea and, you know, there's pictures of them with the former uh, fascist ruler of South Korea, uh, Pat Gun Hai, who's now in jail herself for corruption, you know, meeting with her and then meeting with defectors. Uh, and it is, you know, it's unbelievably biased because, uh, you know, uh, the people preparing this report cannot have been naive. Uh, you know, they must, uh, you know, everyone realizes, you know, there's a tense situation. Uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and you know the two, uh, you know two uh, entities stand in confrontation with each other, and you know basically what they've done is to go to one side. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, good. All of the questions that I've pre-prepared are gone now. So, if anybody wants to ask questions in the chat, we'll probably go for around uh, ten to fifteen more minutes. I'd reckon. If that's fine. Bye. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah. So it is it's weird how they're actually able to do this to a country. Like like, like the, to this level uh, to a country. Like even uh, even in the uh, China stuff where they're manufacturing consents, it's not even it's not even as like ingrained into the public consciousness as the uh as what is said about korea which i find interesting and also uh, scary about the way that uh, information is is presented to us yes i, I think uh, that's a, a very valid ob observation mm. uh you know as we've remarked uh you know it's on it in an industrial scale and the uh, ruling class imperialist in imperialist countries uh, see uh, the DPRK as the last bastion of socialism, which they've got to try and knock down at any cost. 
And, you know, as I was stressing earlier, you know, there's also the geopolitical uh, significance of the Korean Peninsula. And, uh, you know, they probably think if they knock the DPRK down, then, uh, you know, they will be able to make massive inroads into uh, China and Russia. And um, with uh, the hostility to China, which has emerged in the last few years, uh, you know, I think the ruling class in, in the imperialist countries uh, do actually view China and the DPRK uh, differently. Uh, you know, they see the DPRK as the last bastion of socialism, whereas China is seen as more as a economic rival, a, uh, you know, strategic rival. Uh, so, you know, there's a different pitch of hostility. Uh, you know, the uh, DPRK is uh, sort of caught up by the sort of wave of hatred of sort of post postmodernist anti-communism uh and liberalism uh which tends to cut across part different parts of the uh, political spectrum i uh, yeah as the uh last at least what i consider to be a socialist country in the world with nuclear powers um it would be like i still consider uh, cuba socialist obviously but them not being a nuclear power and uh, them literally being over the border with the US has a lot to do with uh, the way that they're characterized as opposed to Korea. Yes, that's correct. Mm. Uh, so um, I'm surprised that more. Oh, wait, here's a question. Right. Do you think Juche will change this time as a regular over time? No, I, I, I do not think uh, it will. Uh, it's, it's a, a, a communist idea. You know, it, it might uh, develop more in depth, but I mean, I, I don't think it will change its basic nature. Uh, I'm trying to find the uh, question. Oh, here we go. Right. <laughs> A provocative uh, question. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, I think everyone would, uh, you know, a lot of people would uh, like it if the DPRK, um, uh, share, you know, sent nuclear weapons to uh, Bolivia or Venezuela. I'm not sure whether either of those countries uh, would actually want them, though. Mm. Uh, and probably to disappoint people, uh, you know, when the DPRK had its first nuclear test, uh, um, you know, the DPRK foreign ministry produced a statement. Uh, the uh, DPRK stressed that it would not export nuclear weapons. It wouldn't proliferate them. Uh, so, you know, it's committed to uh, non-proliferation, uh, basically. Uh, the DPRK's nuclear weapons are self-defensive for the DPRK's defence. Uh, you know, however, you know, uh, the DPRK is an internationalist uh, state, and uh, if asked, uh, you know, by either Bolivia or Venezuela or elsewhere, uh, you know, for some form of ass assistance against imperialism, which didn't involve nuclear weapons, uh, the DPRK would uh, help and just give examples. Um, they assisted uh, Cuba at the time of the Cuba Missile Crisis in 1962, and, uh, you know, a whole uh, squadron of KPA Air Force pilots was sent to Vietnam during the Vietnam War and also to Egypt during the 1973 uh, Mideast War. But, um, uh, no, uh, the, you know, the DPRK is not going to uh, assist uh, other countries with nuclear weapons and, you know, and in fact, uh, you know, 
neither of those countries are asking the DPRK for nuclear weapons. I feel like Venezuela and uh, and Bolivia would probably have the resources at this point, probably. Um, however, the fear of breaking international law, I feel, is part of why they are still committed to democratic socialism as opposed to uh, a more revolutionary strain. Uh, yeah. Also with Cuba, they I'm pretty sure they literally can't because of the whole uh, Cuban Missile Crisis have nuclear arms. Yeah, so I think so. Uh, I think so. Mm. So, um, do you have anything that you'd just like to talk about in general, or right uh, is on your mind? Well, um, you know, a, cu um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, uh, this year I've produced a couple of books. I'd produced the book Career of uh, Duce, which seems to have uh, be popular with the people who have bought it. Uh, that, you know, uh, explains really how Duce is applied in the DPRK and the achievements of the DPRK. I've written a uh, fairly... Uh, sort of co uh, controversial book called uh, The Famine That Never Was, which is about the DPRK in the 90s, uh, where I recall uh, the visit I made in 1996 when I didn't actually see anyone starving. Of course, I do not deny that period was an extremely difficult, hard and challenging period for Korean socialism. Uh, but, you know, the... Western media reports, which are still dragged up, uh, you know, uh, greatly uh, exaggerated the DPRK's uh, difficulties and sort of painted a false picture. So, you know, I've produced a uh, booklet about it. Uh, you know, KFA-wise, um, in the UK, uh, you know, as everyone knows, we've got COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, uh, two lockdowns uh, and then this tier two, tier three business and possibly a third lockdown, dare I say. I know some people will will feel like killing me for mentioning that, but, uh, you know, yes. um, Johnson seems to have made a complete mess of uh, co the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so at the moment, unfortunately, UK KFA activities are online. Uh, we're hoping, uh, you know, like everyone else, mm. this is all going to be over next year. Uh, so maybe February or possibly April, we'd be able to start holding meetings again, uh, maybe do a picket prob uh, of the BBC or the US Embassy or the Foreign Office or something. Uh start rolling out regional meetings again and uh, we've had a you know we had, uh, this year we had a, a meeting planned for liverpool which we had to call off uh because because the lockdown got announced um you know and possibly we can have regional meetings in a couple other places uh we've started a number of new uh regional kfa pages i've got one for the west of england uh, you know, and one for Yorkshire. So please uh, check those out. Um, please subscribe to the two channels that I'm that we're running, Song and Double O Seven, which is like my personal channel. But you know, I upload uh, DPRK some DPRK videos to it as well as my own and the UK KFA channel. So please subscribe. Uh, to those and you know just stress uh to people you know if you uh support people's career uh you support its right to independence uh and you support the socialist system uh there you know kfa is the organization to join uh because uh we do what it says on the tin and defend uh, the DPRK. Some people say 24-7, but I think that's a very, very big exaggeration. Um, but, you know, we do what we can uh, to uh, defend the DPRK. There's no half-hearted 
uh, mealy mouthed uh, statements from us. You know, we we uh, you know lay it down on, on the line uh, defence of uh, the DPRK. Uh, well, I'd stress that uh, KFA is, you know, friendship body, it's uh, cultural, it's solidarity. And for people who want to study the Juche idea and Sungam idea, uh, with the British Group for the Study of the Juche idea and the Association for Study of Sungam Politics, where you can learn about the Juche idea and Sungam idea uh, in those organisations. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, next year, you know, COVID-19 permitting, uh, we must and we, we will uh, have some kind of cultural event, not sure the exact format, uh, but, you know, in the past we've had exhibitions of hand-painted DPRK posters uh, uh, from the DPRK in, in London, unfortunately, you know, no lot of people so London can't afford to get there. Uh, mm. But, you know, who knows, maybe we'll be able to go into a regional centre in Britain. Uh, so it might be a poster exhibition or it might be another kind of cultural format or a, a book exhibition. Uh, you know, one, one great idea would be to have a showing of different uh dprk films and lastly uh you know for british and european people like uh, you know american friends are unfortunately prevented by their government from traveling to the dprk um hopefully next year the dprk will be lifting its own covid restrictions uh so we'll be able to receive foreign visitors again mm. uh so, you know, I would urge uh, people, I know it's a big ask, it's expensive, um, but, you know, if you're able to, you're able to save the money, uh, please uh, go and visit the DPRK. Uh, just don't take my word. Uh, as Korean people say, it's better to uh, see once than hear a thousand times. So go, please go visit DPRK, see the reality of uh, Juche socialism. We're hoping to send some sort of delegation out in 2022. Mm. Uh, thank you. By the way, I am going to, I'm going to, I'll leave the uh, YouTube links after I finish the stream, but uh, there's a question here. Um, Mm. Yeah. Um, again, this is this is sort of thing that I could sort of spend all evening talking about. Uh, I often do really, run about this. Yeah, it's not something uh, you know. It's really within my my KFA uh, remit. You know, I think you know there's probably all sorts of reasons for uh, for it, but I would say it's probably uh you know the spread of bourgeois ideology uh in society which you know people don't realize is pushed more heavily than ever uh you know you've seen in the last 10 20 years the big expansion of the internet and social media uh so that gives some platform for alternative voices but of course we forget we forget that, you know, for every progressive uh, website, there'd be a hundred or a thousand, you know, reactionary ones. And I think, you know, the, the rise in uh, liberalism, you know, people who are say, saying they're, you know, oh, I'm a socialist. But, you know, when you speak to them, uh, you'll find they're a real uh, liberal uh, is, down, is, is basically down to uh, bourgeois make ideology making a greater and greater inroads in into the left you know i could go on forever about this and you know you know speaking as a bit of an oldie uh you know i can remember the days in the 70s early 80s when the labor party left you know the uh left of the parliamentary labor party 
uh, included a number of people who were close to the one or other of the socialist countries, Soviet Union, GDR. Uh, in fact, even um, a delegation of free labor MPs went to the DPRK. I'm, um, I, I'm reminded of, I've read a Tony Banzo biography. And in that, there is a actual peach tree in Russia from when he visited in the 60s, uh, when he visited the Soviet Union. Um, so there were some uh, inroads towards, like, um, towards some sort of uh, advocacy. Yeah, um, oh, that's, that's right. You know, there were people on, on the Labour left who, you know, were actually strong supporters of uh, the socialist countries. Uh, but now... Uh, that doesn't exist. I think you've got one or two Labour MPs that support Cuba, but nowhere else. And that's, uh, you know, that's the that's the limit of it. You know, and that, uh, that shows you, uh, you know, how, how the, the, the wrong kind of ideology has made uh, deep inroads. And all we can do is try our hardest to sort of counter bourgeois ideology and the shift to the right and and uh, uh, liberalism. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like we've basically covered everything I uh, propose to talk about. So I'll probably end the broadcast and we can talk in this uh, actual um, in this actual thing after we end the broadcast. Yeah, I must so put up, up a link to the uh, DPRK Korean book site because people can get free downloads uh, from from there. Yeah, uh, I'll leave that. If you send me the link on Facebook, I'll just put it in the description once I. Oh, uh, okay, right. Yeah. Cheers. I'll, I'll do that. So uh, I'm probably going to sign off. If there's anything you want to say, uh, Hudson. Well, I'd just like to uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, and I think it's been a very interesting and positive discussion. Look yeah. forward to working with you in the future. I would hope we can have another stream because it's good to, because especially on the Korean Peninsula, um, even the leftists who consider themselves Marxist Leninists don't have as much knowledge as uh, somebody who's visited there 18 times That's right, uh, yeah. throughout the years. So I really appreciate you for coming on especially seeing as this is my first stream and uh, i'd like to have you on again obviously at some point i hope uh, i'd have a camera that doesn't crap out halfway through <laughs> but um yeah so uh thank you for coming and also uh thank everybody in chat for attending um and uh i'm probably go so going to uh, sign off so uh, see you comrades okay goodbye Bye. Bye. Okay.